stuff. Yeah, very true. Well, good evening and welcome to the pre-concert conversation. Uh, this is the live stream and it's hosted by the Omaha Symphony and KVNO. I'm Colleen Cook. I'm host to the Classical Commute, which is KVNO's afternoon drive show from 4 to 6 p.m. And uh, I'm really glad to be with you this evening. Uh, this weekend, very important, Maestro Thomas Wilkins takes the stage Friday and Saturday night, March 26th and 27th. And it's going to be one of his last performances as music director of the Omaha Symphony. You won't want to miss it. And joining him is a young musician who's been described as one of the most dynamic young cellists around. It's Joshua Roman. He's been here before. He's not a stranger to Omaha. Well, tickets to Wilkins and Roman, they're on sale now. They're going quickly. You don't want to miss it. Don't wait. Go to omahasymphony.org as soon as we're done this evening and get your tickets now. But uh, joining me tonight um, are uh, Josh Roman and uh, Maestro Thomas Wilkins here to talk about the upcoming concert at the Holland Performing Arts Center. Good evening to both of you. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Maestro Thomas, this is not just another concert. Not that uh, Omaha Symphony concerts are, are not ever special. They're always special. But there's something really special about this one. Why should people come this weekend? Well, I, it, it, I, I think these days they're all special. And uh, one of the reasons that they're special is because unlike a lot of places across the country, uh, we actually have an audience in the, in the room. Um, and uh, that, uh, that is a great treat. We, we have all been starving, both uh, th those of us on stage have been, have been you know, chomping at the bit to be able to share music again, and those are, who are sitting in the audience have been chomping at the bit to hear music again. So uh, I, I think the fact that we're still in the thick of all of this, and yet we get to come together around some great music and some great artists, uh, that's what makes it really special. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do as my tenure came to an end in Omaha in my final season was I wanted to be surrounded at, with my friends as guest artists. Uh, and so I, 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 I remember I texted Joshua and said, hey, dude, are you, are you, are you into this? And he goes, yes. <laughs> so um, so here, here it is. And, and you know, in a lot of those cases, we did, that, did, that didn't, didn't happen because of the shutdown, but fortunately, uh, we, we still had a, had a chance to bring Joshua back uh, to Omaha, so I'm really happy about that. And, and you brought it back on a very special weekend because this is the, a big anniversary for the symphony, right? This is indeed. Uh, this, is, this is the actual 100th anniversary weekend uh, for the orchestra, um, and so uh, it's, that's, that's just icing on the cake. Oh, that's great. Uh, why did you choose Joshua in particular uh, for this 100th anniversary concert? Well, Joshua and I have been friends for uh, quite a few years now. We've made music together quite a few times in a lot. That's, that's um, I'm not sure that I have the words for it, but we, we can communicate with each other sometimes even humorously on stage um, with just the look about something that he played or something that I did or what, whatever happens and music with someone that you love. Uh, and so uh, that's why Joshua. And Joshua, what was it like when you got that phone call? I was so excited. I have so much uh, admiration and respect for everything that Master Wilkins has done with the orchestra. And it's really exciting when that does merge with friendship and you have that, that warmth that, that allows you to be at ease and to communicate in a way that is not always possible. As Master Wilkins talked about, there are many moments that we share um, on and off stage and the ones on stage, they're, they're, they're extra special. And I also feel that every time I come back, I discover something new um about the orchestra about the city and about maestro wilkins and to be able to come have that experience yet again uh in the last season as music director uh is very special to me so i'm very 
excited about that. Well, and we're so glad to have you. And, um, you know, there may not be as many people in the seats, but I guarantee you that there will be as much enthusiasm as ever. Um, that's terrific. Well, um, Maestro Wilkins, you have two French composers. You have two English composers on the program. Uh, let's talk uh, first about the specific pieces that you're playing. Uh, tell the audience what they are, and then we'll go back and consider each one of them uh, a little bit, if you will. What's on the program this weekend? Well, uh, uh, let's see. I, I believe we opened with the Malcolm Arnold Four Scottish Dances, and uh, Malcolm Arnold has always been a a, a, a favorite of mine. Uh, we have the Ravel Mother Goose Suite, and then we have a set of really of, of dances that that Samuel Coleridge Taylor compiled from his cantata, triple cantata, really. Uh, the dance uh, uh, from his Hi Hiawatha uh, music. Um, and then, of course, the Sensons uh, cello concerto with Josh Roman. And and the concert starts out with um, with Malcolm Arnold's Four Scottish Dances, which is really light music. This is kind of a, a treat, isn't it? Uh, uh, it's um, music was inspired by by Scottish dances. Is that correct? The, yeah, in, in, inspired by, but not but not based on, for example. So he essentially takes the flavor of these dances. The Scottish reel is one of them, for example. Uh, and he creates his own music with his own voice. And the, 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 you know, one thing that all four composers share is that they're all great orchestrators. And that was, especially the juxtaposition between Malcolm Arnold, who is one of my favorite orchestrators, and Maurice Ravel, who is, um, <laughs> Ravel, right? Um, uh, so I love that juxtaposition on the program for sure. Um, but but yes, that that's exactly what Malcolm Arnold does. You know, at one moment you, you have this beautiful slow melody uh, where he just says, "This is just a summer day in the Hebrides," um, and it's it's music that, that allows you to exhale. And yes, it's it's like this. There's one moment where in the middle of a movement. Uh, the music actually becomes a little tipsy uh, and, and humorous, um, uh, and 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 yet it is it it's not music to be taken for granted. I guess that's what I mean by the fact that Malcolm Arnold is a serious musician with great orchestration chops, uh, and he just gives us. I think it's a, just a delightful way to begin the program, quite frankly. And that's I'm I'm usually thinking about how I want the audience to feel at a certain time. Uh, and to come out of the gate with a big smile on your face, uh, I think is a great treat to give to the audience. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, when we think of Scottish music, we think of bagpipes and, and, and other Scottish instruments. Is there a way that the instruments and the orchestra uh, kind of mimic these or, or bring out the, the Scottish sounds, so to speak? Oh, he, yes, he, he does that by, in fact, I was going to grab the score. He does that by... Um, uh, you know, choosing certain combinations of instruments. When when he, the bassoon is a big character uh, in this piece, and so you can certainly listen for that. And even the glissandos uh, that you hear, the sliding sounds that you hear in the music, uh, in the in the in the finale, which is just a lively reel. Um, he uses both the rhythm and the color of the woodwinds to give you this this true dance sensation. And the rhythm is that, so as if, as if, you know, feet are just sort of flying in the air. Uh, and then in that, in that country moment that I, I mentioned earlier about the, this Hebrides music, um, uh, the two central characters are the very relaxed horizontal melody and the rolling of the harp. Um, and it's uh, just, it's, it's sensational. Now, I know um, we enjoyed another Malcolm Arnold piece uh, back in February. Uh, you had uh, three shanties for Wind Quintet. Uh, tell us, what draws you back to Arnold's music in terms of putting in your programs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, of course, I did not do because that particular piece. But um, um, it's, it's just delicious music. I mean, I, from an intellectual standpoint, you, I stipulate that he's, as I said earlier, is just a master orchestrator. Uh, but he also has a wonderful gift of melody. Um, and this gift of melody is inviting to me personally. Uh, and so I, I'm al always sort of drawn to those things. What, what the, um, not, not just harmonic 
the climate that that he creates, but just these the colors that he manages to to ring out of the orchestra by certain combinations of instruments, as I alluded to before, uh, and just the the, the the delight of the music. Um, it's 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 not quite dessert, but it surely is full of calories. Life is uncertain. Eat dessert first, right? Well, <laughs> right. <welcome> right <laughs> and maybe that's what we're doing on this program. It sounds like a great idea to me, and uh, I know the audience is going to enjoy it. Now, the other English composer is Samuel Coleridge Taylor, and uh, the music is uh, the suite from the ballet, or Hiawatha, uh, which, of course, uh, he had an, also a very prolific career, uh, composed an incredible amount of music in a short time. He died an untimely death way too soon which was truly tragic. Tell us about um, his career and uh, the suite from the ballet music. For yeah, Hiawatha. you know, this is, again, this is, this is, this was all inspired by the cantata, uh, at the, 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 um, the, the, the wedding feast of Hiawatha, which was the first of the, of the trilogy, uh, or Hiawatha's wedding feast. Um, um, you know, his his father was a doctor from Sierra Leone. His mother was an English woman. Um, um, he lived during the time of Dvorak, and unfortunately, some people refer to him as the Black Dvorak, which is unfair to him uh, and his abilities, his own abilities as a composer. He was well loved by Dvorak. That 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 is that is a certainty. Uh, went to the Royal College of Music, just like Malcolm Arnold, by the way, um, and. As you're right, he composed about 82, 87 pieces. He died when he was 37 years old. He died broke. Uh, he never got to see uh, any of the financial gains from all of the works that would, you know, that that, that would be played after he was gone. Um, but he too had a, uh, a, 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 he had a gift for melody and and harmony for sure. Uh, and he wrote as an Englishman, but then, then this is interesting because like Dvorak, he was fascinated by the American Negro spiritual, uh, the Fisk Jubilee singers. Uh, he just absolutely loved, uh, you know, Dvorak loved Harry T. Burley, the black uh, baritone who would sing spirituals for Dvorak when he was on, when he was in America. Um, Coleridge Taylor was, uh, prof which I find interesting as an English composer, trained in the Royal College of Music, but just fascinated by American music and the music that Black Americans were writing and the whole Native American life uh, that was happening. Uh, it's gonna be redundant, Native American life in America. Uh, but um, all of that was a fascination to him. And that's what drew him to this, this, this work, the poetic work of Longfellow and, and as, as much as um, writing this African soil into his English music, uh, which is one one of the things that makes this piece so extraordinary. Uh, he was fascinated by the by the notion of Pan Africanism, uh, the plight of dark skinned people all across the globe, not just America. Um, and uh, that I think it's safe to say that that was one of his callings in life was to 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 bring out the reality of the life of folks who sort of really looked like him, but didn't live where he lived. And what should audiences be listening for um, in the ballet suite from Hiawatha? I think, you know, there's five dances or five sections, you know, I, I think of, there is nature in this. There's one movement where there's uh, the singing of birds that happens in the, in the flutes and in, 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 in the, in the I, the, the part A of the third movement. The third movement is actually in, in, in two parts. Uh, the second is a conjurer's dance. It has all of the rustic flavor of, um, you know, he, Longfellow was fascinated by this idea of the noble savage, um, and so all uh, all of that sort of flavor, for lack of a better term, finds its way into this music as well. Um, 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 big drama in the in the. Uh, uh, at the at, next to last movie in the in the departure, uh, there's love music in this in this ballet suite, uh, and it sounds. There are many moments that it sounds like it's Native American music, mm -hmm. um, 
and so you 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 That's can sort of, to listen for yeah you will not you will you will you shouldn't be surprised even by its title of course um but uh and 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 the subject matter matter of the title uh that he manages to capture even that native american uh flavor as well in this music all the while clearly revealing his superb classical training uh, as a as a composer in that tradition, so it's it, it's just, you know this is what all you know all of the great many of the great I don't want to be hyperbolic, but all of the, many great composers manage to put their own voice of their native land into their music. You know we we used to apologize for writing American music because it sounded like America. Well, uh, uh, Mahler didn't ap apologize for putting klezmer sounds in his music, and uh, you know people like. Uh, oh, the, 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 apologize for putting a Czech flavor in their music. So uh, all of it's almost kind of a gift um, that he's writing American, quote unquote, American music as a European composer, much like Dvorak did with his Ninth Symphony. Uh, you know, Dvorak said, "I couldn't have written that symphony had I not been an American." Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess Coleridge Taylor couldn't have written this music had he not been so fascinated by both musical life and sociological life uh, in the America that he was experiencing. And that, that, would, that, would, that, that endeavor of his would, in, he would, would demonstrate to us, he was also fascinated by pioneer, other pioneers like Duke Ellington, for example, even though there's, there's nothing jazzy about this music. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting how it speaks to all of those other things in America that was experimental with American music. Well, this should be a very exciting uh, start to, to this program. And then coming up next, of course, is Camille Sassons, the cello concerto number one. Um, and that's where Joshua Roman comes in. Uh, exciting to have you coming to play this. Uh, Camille Sassons uh, started at age three, uh, composing and finished up at age 86, put out 300 plus works, incredible amount of music. And yet, you know, Joshua, he's only known for just a, a few works today. Uh, most of us know him for the Carnival of the Animals. Um, but uh, outside of uh, the cello concerto uh, that you'll talk about here in a minute, what are some other works by Saint-Saëns that people, uh, you think they should know? Well, there's the, the big organ symphony is something that every once in a while will hit a hall. And if you're anywhere anywhere within spitting distance, driving distance, uh, is doing the organ symphony, it's worth going to see. That one's absolutely fantastic. And I actually really love a lot of the smaller works, um, a lot of the show pieces that he wrote. Uh, you know, he wrote, how many violin concertos Maestro opens? It was at least three, right? Yeah, I think so. Maybe just three. He wrote several violin concertos, and uh, those are nice, but a lot of a lot of what he did that I've kind of fallen in love with are the very short pieces. Um, and there's a great album of the collected cello works uh, with Steven Isserlis that has many of those. There's a beautiful sonata, really awesome sonata. In fact, I think there is another sonata as well, but the, the first one is, is, is really powerful. And uh, short pieces like The Swan, which is from the Carnival of the Animals and Allegro Appassionato, which is a standalone piece, have so much character. And it's really, I think it's remarkable how much he's able to pack into um, something that doesn't last very long, but leaves you feeling full. And the concerto that I'm bringing this weekend is a great example of that. When I think of a concerto, I usually think 30, 40 minutes. This one's about 20, uh, maybe 21 if we do a lot of slow stuff. And, <laughs> and it's, uh, it, that, but so you cover so much ground. It's, it's a beautiful piece that really explores color. It's very, very tightly written in the way that Beethoven sometimes would write things. And Saint-Saëns was a huge fan of classical form and in, in many senses, a neoclassicist of his time. Whether that helped his music stick around or not, I don't know. But in the case of this piece, the, and many of his shorter pieces as well, the combination of a classical form and structure with the intense romantic sort of urges that you hear and the passion and the what you're set up to do with sound it's incredibly dynamic and powerful 
I love it. You know, I, I, they say this is one of the great cello concertos, and there are a lot of great ones out there. What makes a cello concerto great, Joshua? You got to be able to hear the cello. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. That's it. That's no, it. no, actually, it is weirdly that is a big part of it. Um, the cello is not an instrument that, even when it's projecting, that cuts through because of where the range is. It's an instrument that connects incredibly well. When you hear the sound of a cello and you hear where the tension is building and where it breaks in the cello, it's very similar to what we're accustomed to hearing where the sound, where our voices start to build in tension and where our voices break. So there's something very connective about that sound and um, the way that energy comes through. But in reality, when you've got 40 to 80 players on stage, that same range is not going to cut through all of the, the wall of sound that an orchestra has. So it takes a really skillful orchestrator to write a cello concerto so that the cello can be heard, first of all. Mm -hmm. It's really, as much as it's a joke, it's it's really based in truth. And since Sals does a good job, he does it without, I think, for especially for such a short piece, I think he does it without sacrificing the orchestra's involvement. There are moments where the orchestra takes over and does its own thing, and it's not just um, it is related to the classical style in the way that it does that, but it's just it's not just a back and forth. There's there's true engagement uh, in a real almost operatic sense that the mm -hmm. orchestra contains characters and sometimes is one character that the cello works with or against or plays off of. It's much more dynamic in that relationship, and that allows the cello as if you want to think of it as the protagonist, to then actually have a journey that is much more colorful than if I'm just the soloist and there's a group that's just there to do, you know, be in the shadows. That's not the case with this piece. And I think it gives the cello room to shine in more of its range, its emotional and uh, sonic range. Now you mentioned, you know, this being a shorter piece. Now he kind of broke tradition, didn't he, with the three movement uh, uh, concerto when he composed this? Is 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 there a different approach that you take in performing this work because of that? Well, he did he did break it in some ways in that uh, there is a there's no pause in between the movements, and because it's so short, it it could feel like a concert piece. Um, and I do take account of that and in terms of energy preparation. I mean, you have to really, and the way that it starts too with the orchestra, boom, doo, 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 like right away, you have to be engaged from, you don't get to walk out and warm up um, like with the Dvorak. You're, you're just, you're on and you go and you have to pack everything, take advantage of every moment that you have and still see the big picture because the big picture is small enough that you actually have a chance of having more people experience it. Um, so the thing that he does by tying the movements together, both in the sense that you don't stop playing and also in the sense that certain themes and motifs return and are used as connective material, those things definitely affect me. But uh, mostly I would say that it's just don't hold back from the very beginning. You're just, there's no time to waste. It's all out there. And and now when the audience is listening, anything special they should listen for? And and are there any, are any surprises in this piece that they should listen for? Well, I'm not going to give away any of the surprises. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there are things to listen for in terms of, I think, feeling the, following the, the emotional arc of the piece. And that is that some of the main themes uh, come back and they come back at moments that, that have meaning. Um, for example, before the, essentially in the transition to what is the second movement to what is the third movement, you hear one of the themes from the first movement again. Um, and it takes you to a totally different place than, than you were the first time. So that's not the only time that that happens. Just sort of listening to the things that are presented. And I think he does a very good job of setting them up. He sets you up with plenty of time, like the curtains are seen as changing and then, then you have a theme. Or like, again, right when you walk out, boom, there's the thing. 
if you hear that enough, that when it, enough time has passed, other things come in between, and then you hear it again, why is it different? How is it different? What's feeling different about this thing that's very recognizable and yet not in the place where we were introduced to it? And I think just noticing those things uh, goes a long way towards giving us each our own experience that is really connected to the sound that's unfolding in front of us. Oh, I am. I, I love the cello. One of my great um, um, regrets in life, Joshua, was not having taken up the cello. So oh, man, well, you can do it. Do it. I'm, Now's a good time. Someone told me I could probably between two and four in the morning in my spare time. But honest to goodness, I would love it. Thanks so much. Um, and, and we're so glad to have you. What's special about playing with the Omaha Symphony? Let me ask you that. I Well, so many things. I think from the very first moment that I was in Omaha, I felt a, a strong connection, maybe partially because I'm from Oklahoma. And Oklahoma and Nebraska have a lot of similarities. And it was really great to be somewhere that had all these familiar feelings. I have friends that have played in the orchestra, um, meeting Maestro Wilkins and, and developing our camaraderie and our friendship and musical friendship together. Um, there's something when you're traveling all the time, and I'm laughing because that's not happening now. Yes. <laughs> but well, in the before. You're all over the place. Uh, to be able to return and to develop, uh, to develop something with other people, and to come back and feel uh, welcome and like there's room to experiment. Some of the like concerto that he'd written for me and then turn around and do the Dvorak concerto the very next week because of a cancellation. <laughs> um, <laughs> those are very special moments. Very special moments. Like, I don't know other places. That, that's Omaha and, and I, I've gotten to know people inside and outside of the orchestra through that and being, being excited to go and knowing that that there's something there already. And it, it's my job now to bring something new to that and to build on that. And I, I love that aspect of my job. And, and Omaha is a place where I feel very strongly that connection. Oh, and I'm sure that uh, we feel that same way. And um, people are really looking forward to this. Uh, back to uh, Maestro Thomas. Uh, last but not least in the program, uh, the last great French composer, Maurice Ravel, uh, La Mer Loire, or if you prefer, the Mother Goose Suite, most of us do. Um, I hear he was fond of children and animals. How did this, how did this uh, suite? Uh, originate. What oh, let me just jump on something that Joshua said before I go to that because I had for, I had forgotten about that snow <laughs> day where we lost in August. And, he, and I think I called you and said, "Are you willing to stay?" And you emailed me or something the next morning and said, "Was that a joke?" Or <laughs> yeah, because we had been we had been joking. This blizzard had started to shut things down. My flight was right. actually can't, my flight to leave after the Kernis was being delayed, and it maybe had been canceled. And backstage at our concert of the Kernis at the museum, we were already right. joking. Well, if if it stopped, what would we do? I mean, we could do Dvorak. And then so yes, right. when I got when you called me, I was like, "Ta ha, nice one." Yeah, it was a fun right. joke. But no, that's yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, they, I, I'm, I'm th thanks for that memory. I had, I had forgotten about that. And I think we shot a scene, right? Did we film something? Oh, where yes, we did something. Car? I was like getting in the car oh. and you ran out and you were like, wait. <laughs> you can't go, you can't go. <laughs> yes. I forgot about that. Yes, yes oh, indeed. That's, that's probably yes. still online oh. where everything oh, was. There are no blizzards in the forecast this week. Oh, morning. yes. Oh. Are, are there really? No, I don't. Oh, good. Because okay. okay. we certainly want people to hear this program. And and to your earlier question, yes, indeed, the Ravel. Um, um, I think Ravel. Uh, for me, there's a there's a there's a, a a handful of of composers who really were the for for me the top orchestrators. I think it was Spiegel. 
uh, I, and, I, and you know, I, I talked about Malcolm Arnold before, but Ravel for me is is just right there. Uh, Ravel was writing opposite of Debussy. Uh, Ravel was moving to, more towards, he was sticking with form. You know, we, they, we used to say that if you're going to take something out, um, you have to be sure that you that you uh, um, fill that void with something else. So, you know, Dvorak took out, I'm excuse me, Debussy took out uh, uh, rhythmic structure, for lack of a better way to put it, but he inserted massive color. Uh, Ravel went the, the exact opposite direction. He, he left structure in place and he still adds incredible color. Uh, this, this, this suite that you're going to hear was actually um, a, um, a piano forehand piece that he wrote for two children of friends of his. Uh, that so so they could they could play these things together and it was actually his publisher who saw beyond Durand who saw beyond that and said wait a minute there's something here and he convinced him to in fact orchestrate it and then um, uh, if I remember correctly it was another colleague who wanted him to actually create these these the suite so he could actually choreograph uh, a, an actual ballet. Um, but uh, it, it begins, begins its life innocently enough, uh, but it ends up being certainly one of his most well-loved and oft-performed pieces. Very true, yes. Yes, and, and um, there are five movements. Um, I know I, I have my favorite. The Fairy Garden is my favorite. Do you, oh, do you have a favorite movement? That's it. <laughs> the Enchanted Garden. That is totally it. I mean... Yeah. Uh, the moment uh, I did it on a, on a young people's concert in Boston a couple a couple of years back, and I set it up by saying that there's there's all of this mystery in the beginning, and and you know he walks into the room and he sees Sleeping Beauty there, and, and he knows there's, a, there's only one way that you know he's going to revive her, and I'm walking up to an elderly teacher while I'm saying it because she's like, like you're not going to kiss me, you're not going to kiss me, you know. But we had so much fun with that, but. That, that moment of grandeur at the end is just, um, uh, just the, the, it, it's my favorite. Although I will say that every time I'm in each one of those movements, I'm loving it for what, for what it is at, uh, at the time. In fact, I, 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 I pulled out the score earlier, um, just the way the opening movement begins as an exhalation uh, in the, uh, in the in the horn and, and and the second flute, it it just breathes across four bars and then it's taken up later by the first flute. I love that moment. Um, I love the the the, the spinning the the the, the um, 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 oh, uh, oh, beauty and the beast, the the the, the contrast between the contrabassoon um, um, and uh, and the other instruments in the orchestra. It, it, it's it's. Uh, that's stunning. The way he manages to get an Asian flavor out of the uh, La Donnette movement, the, the, the uh, third movement of the piece, uh, just by his brilliant use of the piccolo as, as a major melodic force in that movement, it's certainly something to listen for. Um, but um, um, I love every. I, I'm just. I'm staring at the, 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 the movements as I as I talk to you right now, and I'm. You know, I keep flipping the page and going. Yeah, that's a nice moment too. <laughs> I mean, just, just. Well, we have five wonderful ones. They all, uh, well, they kind of take you on a trip into childhood, don't they? Yeah, they kind of They're do. Based on French fairy tales, I guess. The, 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 the actual Mother Goose, yes. Yeah, yeah, and um, and of course, you know, those fairy tales have become. Uh, treasures of um, all, all different countries, including our own. Um, well, uh, if you're in the audience right now, if you have a question for uh, Joshua Roman or Maestro Thomas Wilkins, uh, please feel free to, uh, I guess you can chat it and we'll, we'll pass it on and ask them. Um, let me just say this, uh, Thomas, this is one of your final three, three concerts. Um, at the Omaha Symphony, and I feel sad even saying that we will miss you so much. But uh, let's talk for a moment uh, beyond this weekend uh, a little bit about the last two concerts that are coming up. Uh, I understand you have an engagement with Pink Martini. Is that correct? Yes, right. Yeah. Um, we, again, 
Yeah, they're very popular. And they, they always, we'll see what COVID restrictions does <laughs> under the circumstances, but they usually turn a concert into a party, <laughs> um, which is, um, you know, I have- We I, could do I, a party these days. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, I first encountered them at the Hollywood Bowl um, and while on stage, I realized I was having some of the most fun I have ever had in my life on stage. Um, uh, their talent, notwithstanding, uh, the fact that that they perform music in you know five, six different languages, um, and so there's all these different flavors that happen. I mean, ethnic flavors that happen over the course of a single concert. Um, uh, Thomas is an extraordinary musician and and, and pianist. Thomas Lauderdale, um, and yeah, and, and he's and we we've, we've we've again like Joshua, we've we've known each other as friends for so many so many years. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I got a text from him, and this is typical Lauderdale. It says, "Thomas Wilkins, let's talk about program." Thomas Lauderdale. That was the end of the text. <laughs> okay, um, but um, so that so. Having these guys, they, again, they were on my wish list of people that I wanted to end my tenure with uh, at the Omaha Symphony. And so, and sure enough, they're there. Uh, and then at the end, we it was going to, you know, Joshua and I were joking that the, the, the word of the day in this COVID land that we're living is fluid. You know, you can, you can plan, 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 plan. And all of a sudden, COVID says, nah, that's not going to happen. And so we went through, we went from doing planning on doing Mahler's Eighth Symphony, which is, which is his ginormous work, uh, to Mahler's First Symphony, which I thought, well, that's kind of poetic. It's the first orchestra, it's the first Mahler Symphony that I did with the Omaha Symphony as music director. So maybe it's neat that it's, it's the last piece that I do with him as, 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 um, as music director. And then Kobe says, nope, that's not gonna work. And so we ended up going to Elgar Enigma Variations which I chose, yeah, I mean, I, and I chose it. It, 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 even that has its own sort of poetic nature about it because it was a piece that he wrote dedicated to all of his friends. Mm -hmm. And because that was the gist of my season with our guest artist. I thought, well, okay, that's a great way to end. And um, uh, it's, it's the soloist on that program is one of my oldest closest friends in the music business is Brantford Marcellus. And a, a couple of my colleagues who are from other orchestras, from the Philadelphia Orchestra, who's now on, on faculty at IU with me, he's coming to play that concert because it's my last concert. Originally, he was gonna play that concert anyway because another of my vocal colleagues from IU was one of the solos for the Mahler 8. I mean, it was, so we had it all planned out. Um, so it's, it still ends up being a, a pretty special way to end, end my tenure. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, so that's the blockbuster finale coming up. Uh, folks, if you're listening, uh, go to uh, omahasymphony.org. Take a look at uh, these final two concerts. And while you're there, buy tickets for the one that's coming up this weekend. Uh, we can't wait to see this concert this weekend. It's it's Joshua, it's wonderful to have you here for the 100th anniversary, uh, to be working with your good friend. He's been such a good friend to this community as well. And uh, we're just delighted to have you both back and delighted to have you as our guests this evening. I'm so looking forward to the weekend. I want to be there for all the surprises that you've been hiding. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. <laughs> In fact, there was one moment where we opened the concert with a particular piece of music. I don't remember what. And then Joshua, in his cadenza, played snippets from the first piece of music that we played on the program. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and he, he looked at me with this fish eye, and I went, yeah, I caught it. I caught it. <laughs> I'm expecting yeah. big things this weekend, OK? <laughs> You're going to have to look at the fish eyes because there won't be much behind the masks. That's, it's all going to be in the eyes and in the sound. And Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Yes. Thank you both so much for your time uh, this evening. And we are so looking forward to this weekend. Folks, remember, uh, if they take the stage March 26th, March 27th, 
going to be one of his last performances here as music director of the Omaha Symphony. Uh, dynamic Joshua Roman here to uh, make the program exceptionally special. So, uh, and um, it's the 100th anniversary. What other reason do you need to come? So right now, I want you to go to omahasymphony.org and get those tickets quickly because you're not going to want to miss this one. And uh, we can hardly wait to see you there. I've been to several concerts this year. It's safe. It's well done. And um, it's going to be delightful. 730 Friday night, Saturday night uh, at the Holland Performing Arts Center, the great music of Malcolm Arnold, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, Camille Sassons, and Maurice Ravel. Uh, I'm Colleen Cook. Thanks so much for joining us for the pre-concert conversation. I'm uh, host of the Classical Commute from 4 to 6 on KVNO, where we play all the great music we've talked about tonight and then some. Hey, thanks so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening.